Namaste. So, in this episode of Vichara Sangraham, Ramana gives that short course in yoga that we've been promising for several episodes now. Let's just jump right into it. Devotee, what are the limbs of yoga? Maharshi, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Of these, yama stands for the cultivation of such principles of good conduct as nonviolence, ahimsa, truth, satya, non-stealing, asteya, celibacy, brahmacharya, and non-possession, aparigraha. Niyama stands for the observance of such rules of good conduct as purity, saucha, contentment, santosha, austerity, tapas, study of the sacred texts, svadhyaya, and devotion to God, Ishwara Pranidhara. Asana. Of the different postures, 84 are the main ones. Of these, again, four, Singha, Bhadra, Padma, and Siddha, are said to be excellent. Of these two, it is only Siddha that is the most excellent. Thus the yoga texts declare. Pranayama. According to the measures prescribed in the sacred texts, exhaling the vital air is rechaka, inhaling is puraka, and retaining it in the heart is kumbhaka. As regards measure, some texts say that rechaka and puraka should be equal in measure, and kumbhaka twice that measure, while other texts say that if rechaka is one measure, puraka should be of two measures and kumbhaka of four. By measure, what is meant is the time that would be taken for the utterance of the Gayatri mantra once. Thus, pranayama, consisting of rechaka, puraka, and kumbhaka, should be practiced daily according to ability, slowly and gradually. Then there would arise for the mind a desire to rest in happiness without moving. After this, one should practice pratyahara. Pratyahara. This is regulating the mind by preventing it from flowing towards the external names and forms. The mind, which had been till then distracted, now becomes controlled. The aids in this respect are meditation on the pranava, fixing the attention betwixt the eyebrows, looking at the tip of the nose, and reflection on the nada. The mind that has thus become one-pointed will be fit to stay in one place. After this, dharana should be practiced. Dharana. This is fixing the mind in a locus which is fit for meditation. The loki that are eminently fit for meditation are the heart and the brahma randra, the aperture in the crown of the head. One should think that in the middle of the eight-petaled lotus that is at this place, there shines like a flame the deity which is the self, that is, Brahman, and fix the mind therein. After this, one should meditate. Dhyana. This is meditation through the I am he thought, that one is not different from the nature of the aforesaid flame. Even thus, 
If one makes the inquiry, who am I? Then, as the scripture declares, the Brahman, which is everywhere, shines in the heart as the self that is the witness of the intellect. One would realize that is the divine self that shines in the heart as I, I. This mode of reflection is the best meditation. Samadhi. As a result of the fruition of the aforesaid meditation, the mind gets resolved in the object of meditation without harboring the ideas, I am such and such, I am doing this and that. This subtle state in which even the thought, I, I, disappears, is samadhi. If one practices this every day, seeing to it that sleep does not supervene, God will soon confer on one the supreme state of quiescence of mind. So this is very wonderful. Maharshi is giving the whole yoga path in just eight verses. Now, rather than go into each one of these items separately, I would refer you to two readings. One is the Vichara Sangraha itself, and the other is the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And we have given links to both of them in the video description below. In addition, we have done, or at least begun, a series on the Yoga Sutras on our channel, which you can see here. What I want to highlight, or the message that I want to convey in this video, is to question and look into the issue of why don't so-called yoga teachers teach all the eight limbs? Why is it? They get focused on asanas, and even they don't teach the four most powerful asanas. Singhasana, Padmasana, Bhadrasana, and Siddhasana. But they teach all these athletic and contortionist <laughs> different stretches and stuff like this. Huh? Now, in the Yoga Sutras, which every yoga teacher will say is the source of what they're teaching, the word asana is only mentioned twice. Once in connection with the eight limbs, as it was given here, and again later on in the list of the order of practice. Now the eight limbs as given here are the same as the order of practice given by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. So there's no need to mention it twice. Why do so-called yoga teachers only teach one out of eight limbs of yoga? Well, of course, the answer is they're doing it as a business. And when you have a business, money talks, not the truth. So rather than present the full yoga system, they only give the part of it that people are willing to pay for, for which there is a demand. And since Western culture is completely focused on the body, the gross body, that's what they teach. They don't teach the moral principles, good behavior, good character. They don't teach the cultural uh, regulations that one should have a guru and obey that guru. They don't teach pranayama, or if they do, first of all, they mispronounce it. <laughs> pranayama. <laughs> and then they only teach a few very simple exercises. They certainly don't teach rechaka, 
and Kumbhaka. But these are the real pranayama exercises. And what is the advantage of these? They allow you to control the mind. When the mind is controlled, then it can be withdrawn from the senses. Pratyahara. Now, any Western person who has no background in yoga philosophy would probably ask at this point, why would you want to withdraw the mind from the senses? <laughs> this is ignorance. That the cause of our suffering is that the mind is identified with the senses. Actually, the mind has nothing to do with the senses. There are five coverings or sheaths, koshas. The gross body, where is, uh, wherein are the senses located, is called the anamoy kosha, the food body. But then you have the pranamoy kosha, the energy body, the manomaya kosha, the mental body, the vijnanamaya kosha, the intelligence body or causal body, and finally the anandamaya kosha, the bliss body or consciousness. So what Ramana is saying here is that the consciousness, the attention, is withdrawn from the senses. The mind is controlled and brought within and turned. Huh? We went over this so many times in the early days of this channel. In the uh, Secret of the Golden Flower series, which is still one of our most popular series, that the mind should be turned. It should not be directed out through the senses, but it should be turned around to reflect the self. And this will give us a feeling, a immediate feeling of bliss. That's how you know you got it right. And that leads naturally to concentration, dharana. Dharana means fixing the mind at one point. And of course, the best place to fix the mind is not in the various locations in the body, although the heart the third eye, the Brahma Randra, the opening at the top of the head here, and uh, some other places are given. But really, the mind should be fixed on the self, on the consciousness. That's the best dharana. Concentration, and then out of concentration arises dhyana, meditation. Now, what is meditation, really? Meditation is when concentration ceases to be an effort. This is the beginning of bliss. The pleasure that comes from concentration of the mind increases until it overcomes the resistance of the mind to being controlled and focused. The mind likes to jump here and there and everywhere. As uh, Brahmana discussed in the previous shloka, it's based on air. And like air, it moves by nature. So the mind should be detached from its normal objects and focused on the self and made unmoving, fixed by concentration. And because that leads to a natural form of pleasure, then the mind will remain fixed there by being attracted by that pleasure. And this is the secret of controlling the mind. Huh? Just like controlling a dog or other wild animal is accomplished by feeding it some tidbits, huh? <laughs> some treats. So the mind is controlled by giving it the pleasure of concentration on the self. 
And then this leads to samadhi. Remember, several videos ago, we talked about the house of the self. And in the house of the self, the self is like an unflickering lamp shining steadily in the inner room. So samadhi is when we enter in through the gate of sleep into the inner room and the gate closes behind us. <laughs> so from the outside, the body appears to be asleep. But actually, within, we are quite awake and we are in the presence of the self. And this is the goal. This is the aim of yoga practice. Not simply to have a nice body or good health, although you know, those are side benefits. But to enjoy the original consciousness of being in the presence of the unlimited, the unconditioned, the real, the ultimate. This is self-realization. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung.